Hi, everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for coming to attend my defense, and I'd like to thank you, Tim, very much for that kind introduction. Today, I'd like to share with you my dissertation work, which uses a combination of population genomic and bioinformatic techniques to better understand phage host interactions in the Staphylococcus aureus species. I'll start off with an introduction to Staphylococcus aureus and its phages, the first research chapter of my dissertation, in which I perform a genome-wide association study to identify host determinants of Staph aureus host, phage host range, a pangenomic analysis for known phage resistance mechanisms in the species and their relationships with horizontal gene transfer or with empirically determined phage resistance. And finally, wrapping up with conclusions of these studies and future directions. Staphylococcus aureus was first discovered in the early 1880s by the scientists Friedrich, Julius Rosenbach, and Alexander Ogston who noted that the, the, these bacteria grew as golden colonies or aureus in bunches of grapes under microscope slides or staphylococci, bunches of grapes. This gram-positive pathogen is incredibly common present on between a third and two thirds of people depending on the carriage time that you examine. It's both hospital and community acquired it's diverse in its infection pathologies, infecting everything from skin and soft tissue to, to the heart and, and bloodstream. And it's both increasingly antibiotic resistant, which is a major problem, and I think everyone here realizes that, and vaccine development efforts have failed because this organism has such an arsenal of ways to evade the immune system. Indeed, it will bind antibodies and point outward the variable segments, which otherwise would pro promote opsonization and digestion of these bacteria by the immune system. Now, all these problems with, with vaccine development and antibiotic resistance makes alternative therapies necessary. One alternative therapy is phage therapy. Another one is quorum sensing inhibition. But really, phage therapy is not a new idea. This was used to treat all sorts of bacterial infections back before the advent of antibiotics. And it was even known back in those days with very little knowledge of host range or, or the details of basic phage biology that Staphylococcus aureus was a particularly good target. There was a review published by Monroe Eden and Stanhope Bain Jones, two physicians at Yale in 1935 who reviewed previous phage therapy literature, and they noted explicitly staphylococcus infections in general appear to have responded the best to phage therapy, bacillus coli or E. coli infections, not as much, and really nothing at all for streptococcus infections. Typhoid, they also noted, was not treated well with phage. It was particularly cases where staph aureus caused abscesses, skin, skin infections, surface exposed purulent infections, where phage therapy looked especially promising. Now, at the time, they didn't quite understand why phage therapy was so good, but later work understanding the basic biology of staph aureus phages helped understand that. Staph aureus phages are all tailed phages with double strand DNA genomes, not double strand RNA, not single strand, DNA, not single-strand RNA. These are all cotaviralis, which means tailed, tailed viruses, tailed phages. And these differ both in their morphology and in the types of life cycles that they undergo. The cyphoviridae in the first box on the right are temperate, meaning they can either kill the cell or integrate in the chromosome and exist in a latent state, whereas the virulent myo and potoviridae will just kill the cell, just go through a complete infection process leading to cell death. The cyphoviridae are so named or two, as tube viruses because they have long, flexible, non-contractile tails a couple hundred nanometers in length. The myoviridae or muscle viruses have long, contractile, inflexible tails 
while the Podoviridae have nearly non-existent tails, just tail fibers extending down, and these are named foot viruses. I've reviewed past literature on resistance mechanisms detected, and it's at three of the five stages of the lytic cycle where it's known that Staph aureus has resistance to has resistance mechanisms against phage infection. These stages are just a, a attachment or absorption, where removal of a receptor, alteration of a receptor, or occlusion by other other carbohydrates or proteins can prevent binding. Biosynthesis when when nucleic acids, RNA D or DNA of the phage are destroyed or the cells are killed before infection can complete by restriction modification, CRISPR, and abortive infection systems. And finally, assembly, in which Staphylococcus aureus pathogenicity islands, or SAPIs, will prevent helper phage assembly and multiply at the expense of helper cyphoviridae. I also hypothesize, based on this literature review, that Staph aureus phage host range mechanisms have additive effects. These have different levels of phylogenetic conservation. Walticoic acid, which is present throughout the species. Restriction modification, which is also conserved through the species, but polymorphic with different clonal complexes having different specificity. And finally, at the lowest level, strain specific mechanisms such as abortive infection that are, again, just conserved sporadically in a few strains and in multiple clades. And it's the combination, the additive effects at these three different levels that together I hypothesize determine host range. That being said, I've said a lot about host range, but it's important to define it and understand its limitations. Phage host range I, ideally is the set of strains out of a test set or all possible strains you, you could test that a phage can't infect and kill. But again, that's an ideal de definition. Instead, host range tends to be defined by interaction or measurement method. It could be defined based on adsorption, just the ability of the phage to attach to the cell, penetration or to deliver its cargo, its the DNA inside, based on a, a based on infection or a productive host range, whether phages could infect a cell and, and kill it and produce new progeny, lysi lysogenic host range based on the ability to integrate in the chromosome. And what I'm measuring and is measured in most cases, the bactericidal host range, which doesn't necessarily need infection for killing. It could just be many, many phages bind to a bacterial cell and all the lysins will burst the cell in the case of lysis from without or just a diffused uh, lysin from a previous infection kills the cell. It can also be defined by the measurement method. Placking is, is the method classically used to look at pr a productive infection, but in my case and most cases, it's spotting to measure bactericidal activity of a phage lysate. So here, and I'll get to this very soon, I'm measuring bactericidal host ranges through a modified spot assay. Why then do I need to understand host range? Well, the goal is to personalize phage therapy. I want to understand host range so I can say whether an infecting phage can kill a strain that's infecting a person. The issue then is how can you determine this quickly without the time limitations of culturing? Well, recently there's rapid long read sequencing that's been developed and this could be targeted for host genes explaining host range or another polygenic phenotype. I won't talk too much of it, but one part of my thesis involved developing an amplicon targeted nanopore assay for another polygenic phenotype, not phage host range, but vancomycin intermediate resistance to Staph aureus or VISA for short, based on vancomycin intermediate Staph aureus. The way this assay works is you take a clinical sample in one, you isolate bacteria from it. Ideally, you wouldn't have to, but I've, I've shown that right now you have to isolate bacteria for this to work. And you imagine, you know, maybe some of these bacteria in blue are wild type, and then you have mutants in green and red that have two different mutations that confer a phenotype of interest. You extract DNA from these bacteria, amplify genes of interest, and then 
identify those, those mutations and different genes through sequencing in the fourth step. You prepare a sequencing library loaded into this tiny sequencer that's about the size of a candy bar that can give you data in 24 hours or less. And then on the computer, call the bases in the sequencing data, align those reads against a reference and call mutations and hopefully correctly predict the phenotype based on those mutations. My preliminary effort to find unknown visa mutations was successful. In the vancomycin intermediate resistance strain, which has thicker cell walls I'm showing on top, I found four mutations in, in genes implicated in visa and identifying these in the sensitive strain that had thinner cell walls. This is really important because it can reduce culture time which would save lives. It's estimated in septicemia, there's a 10% increase in mortality per hour. So with that concluded, I'll move into the first of the two research chapters in the dissertation, the phage host range GWAS. So again, the motivating question here was this fundamental paradox about Staph aureus phage host range. Staph aureus uh, phages have have broad host ranges, but there's still some resistant strains. And there doesn't seem to be a simple explanation for this, like say, loss of the waltic oak acid receptor. So how do these strains become resistant and why do they become resistant? I'm answering this in two ways. The retrospective, uh, the retrospective method is to determine to what extent Staph aureus phage host range is predictable based on existing knowledge. To do that, I'm looking bioinformatically at known phage host range mechanisms. And in what I'm going to talk about now, I'm looking prospectively on the other hand. I'm seeing whether it's possible to use a naive hypothesis-free genome-wide approach to learn the most important factors that determine host range. Again, the goal is to use this knowledge to better predict host range and better de design cocktails that would be effective in staph aureus phage therapies. To give an overview of my approach, I'm starting by building a matrix of phage host range interactions using a novel high throughput method. I'm using this hypothesis free genome wide association study to identify possible host range determinants in the host showing that these are, don't just correlate with host range, but they have causative mechanisms with molecular genetics, and then building classifiers or predictive models to predict phage host interactions. The phages that I examined represent all major classes of Staph aureus phages, Cyphoviridae, Myoviridae, and Potoviridae. And the strains are a diverse set covering 47 different sequence types to give a snapshot of species diversity. Now, the way I could have done this and, and has been used in the past to evaluate host range is the spot assay that I talked about a little earlier. There's many issues to this. The way this assay works is you mix a dilution of an overnight culture with molten soft agar, you pour it on top of a plate, and then you spot a small volume of phage lysate and look for no killing or resistance, complete killing or sensitivity, or something in between, semi-sensitivity. Already with what I stated is, is, is a important issue, observer bias. Semi-sensitivity could have many different meanings for diff uh, different people, depending on how turbid the spot is. A phage, uh, the other issue is, is that this is low throughput. There's, there's one strain per plate. You're measuring phage propagation or endolysin killing, and that's uh, Again, a uh, limitation to the high throughput assay, but, uh, but I think valuable for phage therapy just to see whether you kill the bacteria, uh, because in phage therapy, even if the phage infect and the bacteria outcompete, that's not a good outcome. So this high throughput assay, de uh, assay I developed is essentially performing spot assays on individual strains in wells of a 96 well plate. In each well, you put in a small volume of an overnight culture dilution, which is then mixed with lysate allowed to incubate to allow absorption, then soft agar is added, and that's let to grow overnight. Then you measure quantitatively the turbidity in each of the wells. Already that's an improvement over the qualitative output. It's easier to get multiple replicates this way. It's easier to have consistent growth conditions and, and uh, growth phases, getting everything to stationary phase at the same time 
before dilution. And again, it's also just uh, measuring bactericidal host range. Before I decide to use this data for the GWAS, I wanted to make sure it was robust relative to the spot assay gold standard. On the x-axis, you're looking at different classes of strains based on how they were read manually, as sensitive, semi-sensitive, or resistant. And then on the y-axis, you can see the box plots and the distribution of turbidities for strains in each of these categories. What you notice for each of these phages is for the most part, as you go from sensitive to resistant, there's statistically significant increases in turbidity, which makes sense. More resistant would be more turbid. This made me feel comfortable with the robustness and, and the, the output of this high throughput assay. So I proceeded to use it for the GWAS. Before I did the GWAS though, I needed to ask some higher level questions. One is whether phage host range has a phylogenetic bias. A phylogenetic bias means that more closely related strains have more similar phenotypes, which is a significant issue for GWAS because you can't tell genetic background from individual variants that cause a phenotype. To evaluate this just visu uh, uh, visually, I constructed a core genome phylogeny of the strains that were assayed. The core genome, again, is just the genes that all these strains have in common. I built a phylogeny, which is a hypothesis for how these strains descended from each other based on the alignment of those core genomes. And then I place all the phenotypes on the phylogeny. And you can see that resistance or, or more orange colors here emerges independently throughout different clades. So there doesn't appear to be a phylogenetic bias to, uh, to, for uh, host range. I then did two high-level associations, one with clonal complex, because clonal complex te tends to, to correlate with restriction specificity, which affects phage infection, and then methicillin resistance, which could promote phage resistance because methicillin resistant strains can have more defects in walticoic acid biosynthesis and could lead to sensitivity because walticoic acid is necessary for methicillin resistance. In this plot, you can see for methicillin resistant versus sensitive strains, there aren't significant differences with the exception of one phage in their final uh, turbidities. Uh, for what I didn't show you, uh, sensitivity is not associated with individual clone complexes, but it is with CC overall, again, supporting that restriction specificity hypothesis. Phages, as you, different phages have different overall killing. Different CCs are more sensitive to different phages. And for the most part, methicillin resistance is not associated with sensitivity. Now that I've done these high-level associations and checked for phylogenetic bias, I performed a genome-wide association study for phage host range. The goal here is to associate the turbidity levels I measured for each strain with every unique sequence in all the genomes. I use the sequence element enrichment analysis, or SEER approach, which identifies KMERS with significant associations to continuous or binary phenotypes, in this case, continuous. A K-mer is a subsequence of length K, say a 5-mer of length 5, and the advantage to associate K-mers versus just a SNP, a point mutation, is you can look at more kinds of genetic ev events, gene presence, absence, point mutations, or recombination events that all could have causative effects on host range. Now, before I explain the results, let me explain what a host range factor is. That's a KMER significantly associated with either sensitivity or resistance. Different phages had different staph aureus host range factors, and no single host range factor affected all the phages. Interestingly enough, for the most part, there were a small number of exceptions, um, like TAR-P and TAG-H, Receptor genes, walticoic acid biosynthesis genes, did not significantly associate with the host range or resistance phenotype, probably because these are under purifying selection since they're involved in so many other cellular processes, ranging from cell division to antibiotic resistance to uh, virulence. Now, I don't want to go through all classes of genes that came up as significant, but I'll just focus on three that make sense and have biologically plausible roles in phage resistance, and for which a lot of the genes haven't been identified in prior resistance studies. 
the first of these classes is surface proteins. These can either lead to occlusion of the phage receptor, which has been observed for quite a long time, or aggregate formation. The first would increase phage resistance, where the second would decrease it. It also could suggest a relationship with colonization and or virulence, because a lot of these genes like ISDB and SDRE are involved in interactions with human cells. Indeed, the AR, ARLS, ARLR system that's responsible for regulating surface proteins and switching between clumping and biofilm states did come up as significant as did the large surface protein EBH. As far as cell wall and envelope biosynthesis, it's also been known for a long time that O acetylmodification of, of uh, meramic, uh, meramic acid in, in the Staph aureus cell wall is necessary for phage binding, and that came up as significant. This, this has been known since the early 1970s. But also, multiple other genes involved in cell wall biosynthesis, shown at left, came up as significant, as well as part of the ABC transporter that pumps volatilic acid out of the cell, the major tolicin that would be involved in cell wall thickening, and wire A, which is involved in lysostaphyl resistance. Finally, a third class I want to talk about are genes involved in translation and the stringent response. Phages need actively replicating cells in order to replicate. If strains formed a subpopulation or a popul full population that's non-growing in, in a persister state, that would have reduced phage sensitivity. And the way this could occur is either through amino acid starvation or appearance of amino acid starvation through uncharged tRNAs, tRNAs that are charged by the tRNA, amino acid tRNA synthetases just below. Uh, that appearance of uncharged tRNAs then is sensed by the enzyme RELA on the ribosome, which synthesizes PPGPP in response, which binds to multiple proteins on the ribosome preventing ribosome assembly and reducing translation and promoting this, this uh, dormant state. That said, the next question was, how well could <coughs> I predict the host range phenotype based on significant GWAS features? Indeed, for phenotypes that are simple, with most strains being sensitive or resistant, I could predict predict pretty well. But for more complex phenotypes, the accuracy was really only 50 to 60%. To put it another way, when phenotypes, the more complex phenotypes were in terms of information entropy, with the highest being one-third sensitive, one-third semi-sensitive, one-third resistant, uh, the validation accuracy was lowest. Just to define this again, validation accuracy is, is how many strains for which the model correctly predicts the real phenotype in the test subset of all strains. I also wanted to show these determinants didn't just have correlations with phage resistance, but causal roles. So I constructed isogenic transposon mutants in a resistant background, USA 300. Uh, I considered a number, about six, uh, but I, I'm just going to show two here. Uh, trip A, which is involved in tryptophan biosynthesis, and FMTC, which adds a positive charge to the cell membrane by lysolating phosphatidylglycerol. When you construct transposon mutants in either of these two genes, there's a significant decrease in resistance, a decrease in turbidity. You don't see a change when you put in a significant change when you put in an empty vector. And then when you complement again, either you get full restoration of the wild type phenotype or partial restoration. Interestingly for FMTC, when we complement with an allele from the strain NRS209, which is different from the vast majority of the others, you don't see restoration of the phenotype. So this appears to be an allele specific effect. In conclusion then from this part of the dissertation, Resistance to each of the phages tested lacks a phylogenetic signal and appears to emerge independently along the tree. So, uh, cell surface, cell wall, and envelope biosynthesis and translation and stringent response related genes all have biologically plausible phage resistance roles. 
significantly associated genes in the GWAS are not only previously identified phage resistance determinants, and significant determinants predict host range with between 60 and 95% accuracy. So especially for the complex phenotypes, there are a lot more determinants to be discovered. And at least several of the genes that were found significant show causative roles through molecular genetic experiments. This invites larger hypotheses. It could be that lots of mutations escaping immune, uh, affecting uh, immune response escape or interactions with other bacteria on the skin affect phage host range or the other way around. There could be trade-offs for one relative to the other <coughs> or, or uh, collateral consequences or vice versa. Additionally, it's interesting that we found very different resistance mechanisms in the natural population relative to the lab. It could be there's different resistance mechanisms present and selected, or this could just be an artifact of different resistance assays or selection mechanisms, multiplicities of infection and local levels of phage in the wild versus in the lab. From there, I'm going to go into that retrospective study, this pangenomic analysis of what has already been discovered as far as phage resistance determinants and whether these predict horizontal gene transfer and measured phage resistance in the species. The main question here is knowing phage host range genes from a thorough literature review, how are these distributed over our database of 40,000 or more curated annotated staph aureus genomes? Are there clades that are more phage resistant than others? Do, do phage resistance ge genotypes predict the phenotype? And is there some kind of pooling action where clades that have more antibiotic resistance and virulence got that way because of less resistance? Or do uh, clades that have phage resistance tend to pool antibiotic resistance elements amongst themselves given that transduction movement of Host genetic material through phage infection is the major horizontal gene transfer mechanism in this species. So I have a number of hypotheses that I seek to test and test with this study. One is that there could be an arms race dynamic on core genes. There could be positive selection on, on host genes if the host and phage are rapidly co-evolving with each other, but not on essential sites. Whereas on the other hand, if these genes have other functions that are critical, there could be negative selection to retain those functions. I expect there to be levels of genomic modularity, one, because a lot of these genes, say for wall to acid biosynthesis, are encoded in operons, and phage resistance genes are known to be clustered in defense islands based on, again, common function. Like I said very early in the talk, I expect there to be a degree of phylogenetic modularity, correlation with clonal complex and with higher or lower levels uh, phylogenetically, which again, then tie, uh, helps us think about how this pooling action works. Say within CCs, there might be some CCs that have more accessory antibiotic resistance or virulence genes than others based on restriction preventing movement of DNA, uh, into, uh, preventing DNA uh, from getting into, into other CCs relative to that one. So before I go through the results, I want to tell you about some of these illustrious, eminent, distinguished genes that have been included in the survey. As far as absorption resistance, I've included wall to coic acid and capsule biosynthesis. The biosynthesis uh, stage genes include known mechanisms like restriction modification, uh, abortive infections, super infection immunity by which temperate phages after they've integrated will prevent infection by an identical temperate phage and CRISPRs, although they're very, very rare in Staph aureus compared with other species and other gram positives. But in addition, I've also included phage defense systems only reported in the past three years. Retrons that synthesize DNA, RNA, covalently linked molecules, which sense cellular functions being disrupted and, and can cause abortive infection. Cyclic binucleotide associated signaling systems that also act against phages and towards abortive infection, relying on messengers like cyclic uh, GMP, AMP. The Zoria abortive infection system that will depress proton mode of force upon sensing a phage protein, and many others. All these just included 
uh, for the first time in a study of staff with homologs that haven't yet been, uh, been characterized in staff. Then for assembly resistance, I look at the three hallmark pathways by which Staphylococcus aureus pathogenistae islands cause resistance to helperphages. Capsid remodeling or, or, or shifting capsid biosynthesis towards smaller heads for the smaller SAPI genomes. Packaging interference in which SAPIs will inhibit the terminases that push DNA into helperphages. And finally, helperphage transcription inhibitors that will inhibit late stage phage genes in the helper cyphoviridae, not the SAPIs. So for the first part of the paper, I, I'm just talking about the survey and looking at the patterns of these genes to the species. How are these conserved? Uh, what are the phylogenetic associations, at, especially at the clonal complex level? How are non-core genes co-encoded? And then looking specifically at core and extended core genes, what are the levels of diversity, functionality, and selection to get at that arms race dynamic question? Everything after that will focus on non-core genes. So just looking at gene conservation, I plotted on the left side, the genes base from most conserved to least conserved. And you can see amongst those found in about 40, 43,000 genomes that the vast majority of these are absorption genes. These are red genes that are core genes. Uh, the other below that are, are mainly biosynthesis. And then if we uh, visualize these results in another way as a violin plot, we can see absorption genes are the most conserved, followed by assembly that are intermediately conserved, and then biosynthesis, many of which are incredibly poorly conserved. Before I go further, I want to make sure I'm absolutely clear uh, with you about what core and extended core genes are. Core genes are found in the entire species. Extended core in 80% or more of strains in the species, just to uh, get uh, to cover the full scope of common genes in the species. And non-core or non-extended core are 100% or less or 80% or less, respectively. I looked phylogenetically then at the association, possible uh, association between clonal complex and accessory genome or accessory phage resistance gene content. And in both cases, there was a significant overall association. There are significant differences across CCs in the level of accessory genome content or, or the level of accessory phage resistance genes. Again, supporting that CC type one restriction specificity story that's been known for a long time and has been shown experimentally. I then looked at phylogenetic signal, which I talked about in the GYs, but I'll explain again. Again, uh, phylogenetic signal is the idea that more closely related strains have more similar phenotypes, in this case, are more likely to have the same genes present. And <clears throat> indeed, I found all these phage resistance genes had phylogenetic signal and uh, had, phylogenetic, had phylogenetic signal. And I was able to tell that by randomly shuffling the presence and absence on the core genome phylogeny about a thousand times, getting a null distribution for that, and then comparing individual cases to that distribution. In all cases, there was significantly more consistency than you would expect on average. But that said, uh, for adsorption, biosynthesis, and assembly, these are all significantly less consistent with the phylogeny than non-extended core genes in general. And assembly by far were the, the least phylogenetically biased, which makes sense because these assembly resistance genes are carried on Staphylococcus aureus pathogenicity islands, which are horizontally, horizontally transferred, which would break up linkage with the phylogeny and make these more inconsistent with the phylogeny, thus having less phylogenetic signal. So higher on this plot means less phylogenetic signal. I then looked at co-encoding again, expecting that phage resistance genes tend to be encoded together and that those with similar functions tended to be encoded together. Again, the question here is for strain coding one non-extended core phage resistance gene, how many others are encoded of each category? 
On the x-axis, what, and what's shown the different colors is the query gene classes. And the y-axis is for the particular target, other assembly genes. For, a, for strains having containing that query gene, how many assembly genes are encoded, how many biosynthesis, how many adsorption. And what you can see is most significantly in all cases, adsorption associates with adsorption. Most, uh, most strains with an absorption gene tend to have more uh, other adsorption genes than any other category. Same thing for biosynthesis and same thing for assembly. Then having examined that genomic modularity, I, I started asking questions about arms race dynamics. I expected increased diversity, uh, diversifying selection, and possibly decreased functionality, say if walticoic acid biosynthesis genes to lead to resistance, if there was an, an apparent arms race dynamic going on with core genes. I didn't find support for that. There were not significant differences between core phage resistance genes and all core genes or extended core phage resistance genes and all extended core genes. Um, as, as far as measuring functionality, the way this was done was through, through calculating delta bit score, where you align a protein sequence to a profile hidden Markov model and then subtract the bit score for the test protein from that of the reference protein. That's a delta bit score. The idea here is mutations at conserved amino acids matter more for functionality than ones out at non-conserved amino acids. Indeed, there aren't significant differences in functionality. Finally, then for selection, I didn't see significant differences. I, I didn't see significant differences uh, either. I measured selection as non-synonymous changes relative to synonymous changes for these genes, again, calculated from each gene's phylogeny. Now then, shifting to the second part of the paper, I want to examine the practical genotypic and phenotypic impacts of, of predicted phage resistance. I want to see the relationship between these known phage resistance genes and empirical phage resistance, accessory genome content, and non-extended core antibiotic resistance or virulence genes. For reference, empirical phage resistance is what I measured in the GWAS paper. Amongst the different gene categories examined, it was really just superinfection immunity that strongly co correlated with just temperate phage resistance. Phage 11 and 40 here are temperate phages, whereas 2Y and PYO are virulent phages. And you can see that there's no relationship for the virulent phages, but for the temperate phages, there is. Superinfection immunity also correlated with accessory genome content, <clears throat> which you can see on the far right. There weren't significant, rela uh, significant relationships, uh, except for absorption. Um, and this increase in the accessory genes as there's more superinfection immunity genes corresponds to more prophages being encoded or more genes being ca uh, carried along with prophages or increased levels of transduction that correspond to, uh, to uh, that correlate with also ha having more uh, prophages. I then asked whether phage resistance genes we associate it all with non-core antibiotic resistance and virulence genes and the set of complete genome, staph aureus genomes and staph opia. And these are only weak correlations, but interestingly positive in all cases for virulence genes. This makes sense again for adsorption because capsule can count as a virulence gene for um, assemb for assembly, because, uh, because staphylococcal pathogenicity islands carry assembly genes and carry toxic shock syndrome toxin and other virulence genes. And finally, for superinfection immunity, as it's known, even though it's weak, because it's, it's known that, that uh, prophages will often carry uh, uh, virulence genes like the immune evasion cluster that helps get around complement. So taken together, adsorption genes are the most conserved followed by assembly and biosynthesis. Phage resistance gene counts are associated with overall CC. All non-extended core phage resistance genes have phylogenetic signal, but it's by far the weakest for assembly genes. 
uh, these phage resistance genes that already been uh, discovered tend to be encoded together, especially with those of the same type. Uh, there don't appear to be arms race dynamics, at least in the core genes. There is diverse and functional and under negative selection, again, likely due to waltic oic acid having important roles for other cellular processes like antibiotic resistance. But we haven't looked at whether there's arms race dynamics present in, in the levels of, of um, mobile defense island, of phage defense islands, for example. Superinfection immunity correlates with tempered phage resistance and increased accessory genome content. And really that's just the one where we see positive relationships. And increased biosynthesis and superinfection immunity in genes especially correlate with increased levels of non-core antibiotic resistance and virulence. And from there, I'll move into the final conclusions and future directions. I found in the first day really that it was Host, uh, I, that there are host range determinants with subtle phenotypic effects, such as altering population dynamics between phages and hosts, not preventing infection, but helping hosts outcompete the phages. Only around half the host range phenotypic variation could be explained by significant determinants. So there's a lot more that has to that needs to be discovered there to further explain the variation. You know, a lot more determinants. Known phage uh, resistance genes appear to be under purifying uh, selection, especially the core uh, genes. Superinfection immunity best correlates with empirical phage resistance, accessory GM content, and antibiotic resistance and virulence gene encoding. And then as far as future projects, I really wanted to isolate uh, phage resistance uh, mutants that has been done in the past, but our group and others have mainly found unstable phase variable mutants when we try to select for this. Uh, Bruce, I know, has, has found uh, small colony variants that are resistant to the PYO myophage. Another question is how phages and antibiotics interact to kill Staph aureus, as it's been shown that sublethal doses of translation inhibitors enhance uh, plaque size. And it could be that, that you know, having chemicals that, uh, small molecules that modify cellular processes could could titrate in some way to favor a phage infection and killing uh, better. So those synergistic or antagonistic effects need to be explored further. Additionally, I've only looked at eight phages and really there's much more to be learned about Staph aureus phage genetic diversity in terms of prophages and the spectrum from completely functional to totally cryptic, uh, tempered phages in the wild and then lytic phages, which just from my preliminary bioinformatic examination look incredibly rare. It's also important that we select for improved staph aureus phages through co-infection. And you know, it could be that our best candidates for phage therapy we haven't seen yet. That by taking multiple similar phages, mixing them together in a cocktail, co-infecting with them and co-infecting with them, we can select for recombinants that have expanded host ranges, better lytic properties, and the ability to kill those resistant mutants. And with that said, I'd like to thank everyone in the lab for their support all these years whether with experiments, criticism on papers, or just their ideas. My advisor, especially, for being incredibly supportive and standing with me through all the changes this project has, has gone through. My dissertation committee for their support. Um, everyone who's provided reagents or other support for these projects. The National Science Foundation for financially supporting me. And my parents, most of all, for making this possible and without whom I wouldn't be here. And with that, I appreciate your attention. I'm happy to take your questions.